Afternoon, guys. If you're there, go ahead and put your name in so I can keep an accurate roll. I got to do that. <clears throat> Type your name in so I can put a present by your name, please. Hi, Jordan. I hope you're well today. Hey Shakira, Stephen, how's it going? Hey Brooke. Guess all you guys are healthy. Jessica, hi Jessica. Hi, Kenya. Hey, Heather. Give them a couple more minutes and then we'll charge right in. Thanks, Brooke. Appreciate that. Hi, Brianna.
Hey, Paul. Ashley, there you go. Good to see you. Okay, it's 2.05. Now, I want to ask you something here. This is probably kind of crazy, but um, let's see. Let me just ask one person here. Jessica Sessions. I'm going to open up something here, Jessica, and see if you can see it on the screen. Okay? Can you see anything on the screen, or are you still looking at me, or is it just blank, or what? Okay, so, all right, I kind of figured that. But I was just looking through your e-text. I think some of you guys are maybe have a split screen. You've got that capability. And I was looking at um, maybe some option for us. But apparently that's not going to work. Okay. So let's go to page 352. We're going to go back over that um, series of events that um, makes the muscle contract. So you look on page 352. And maybe you can fill in a few blanks if you have taken a little time to try and write out that sequence of events, which I want you to know. <clears throat> so you're looking at figure 10, 12. And all they're doing there is they're giving you the picture of the neuromuscular junction. I don't have Zoom on my equipment. I may end up getting it there, but I don't have it on there now, Steve. But look on page 352, figure 1012, and so you see the, the axon terminal. You see the um, synaptic vesicles in that terminal. You see the little uh, diamonds in there. That's the acetylcholine. Hi, Dominique. Missed you last time. <clears throat> you can see over to the left the sarco, uh, sarcolemma, the um, cell membrane of the muscle. Page 352, Dominique, figure 10, 12. And then you see the little purple structures called the acetylcholine receptors. Those are proteins that go through. Hey, Jessica. Jessica Shelley. Okay, good. Glad you're here. We're on page 352, Jessica Shelley. Uh, we're looking at the acetylcholine receptor, those purple boxes. And they go all the way through this, the sarcolemma. Remember the fluid between the, um, the axon terminal and the sarcolemma? They call it extracellular fluid. It fills a space, as you see there, that word synaptic cleft. Cleft is a, is a hollowed out area. And you got a lot of sodium in that fluid. Okay with that. On page 353, here starts the action now. You already know the uh, structure of the uh, muscle fiber. So now we've looked at the neuromuscular junction or the myoneural junction. So we're on th 353. You see that green arrow coming down the axon terminal? 
So an axon, excuse me, an action potential travels to the terminal, the axon terminal. And you see it causes the synaptic vesicle that's got acetylcholine in it to fuse with the cell membrane of the axon. Remember, those vesicles are actually made out of the same material as a cell membrane. So you got the acetylcholine vesicle fusing with the cell wall, excuse me, cell membrane of the neuron, and out comes the neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. Remember that fuse, that, you know, that emptying where the vesicle fuses with the cell membrane of the axon. Remember, that's exocytosis. See, that's bringing chapter three up into uh, chapter 10. The acetylcholine, next step here, acetylcholine attaches to those proteins that go through the cell membrane, the sarcolemma. When they attach to that protein, those proteins open and sodium rushes in. Remember, sodium is plentiful in that synaptic cleft. You can see that little word over to the right uh, by the last protein. And so when those proteins open up, sodium rushes in. Why does it rush in from the cleft into the cytosol of the circle of the cytosol of the muscle fiber? Why does it do that? Anybody got an answer? Concentration gradient. That's why it's moving from an area of high concentration in the extracellular fluid into the cytosol where the concentration is not really as high. And so that is a concentration gradient. That's right, Akinya, that starts the contraction. Now, it really doesn't, it's got a couple other things to do, but it's getting real close to starting the contraction. But sodium moves in because there's more sodium in the synaptic cleft than there is in the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. So high to low, concentration gradient. Now look on page 354. You're looking at figure 1014. As you look at the axon terminal, you see the sarcolemma with the little transverse proteins that go through the membrane. You see the sodium coming in. Notice the positive charge now. Inside the muscle cell was more negative. Now it is more positive because sodium, which is a positive ion, has rushed in. So follow the little plus marks to the right. This is what we would still call an impulse. Um, an action potential. And you see they take a dive down the transverse tubule. And those little pluses go all the way down to the transverse tubule. And that causes calcium channels to open. If you'll look on the right-hand side of the, the right terminal the uh, cisterna, you see up there uh, at the top of that blue structure, it says sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's really a terminal cisterna. you got one on either side of the transverse tubule. And you come on down that uh, blue 
sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is actually a terminal cisterna, and you see calcium channel opens. So as soon as that action potential gets down to that area, it causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or specifically the terminal cisterni, to release calcium. Now that calcium is going into the cytoplasm or the cytosol of the myofibril, or excuse me, of the muscle, actually around the myofibrils. And what they've left out of there is the picture of the myofibril with the A band and the I band. But that calcium comes out into the cytosol. Now look over on page 355, figure 1015. Look at the bottom square. There's two bottom squares. Look at the left one first. Figure 1015 on page 355. Now, what you see in that picture is you see a myosin head. You see the actin filament. You call, they call it the thin filament. Notice the blue line. That's the protein called tropomyosin. If you're, if you're trying to find it on an um, e-text, I've got this drawn up. should be on about page 356 or 57. It's labeled 1017 on your e-text, if that helps you. So you see the little blue line. If you look really closely, you can see a little shadow under the blue line on those actin segments. That little shadow is the little active site. It's a little carved out area according to the diagram. It's like a little grape with a tiny little hole in it. And you see tropomyosin covering those little openings. That's keeping the muscle relaxed. Now, if you follow the blue line, it's up top, that's tropomyosin. You look at the three little spheres, yellow, and it's called troponin. That's another one of those proteins that we've got to have in order for contraction. So, look to the next rectangle or square over to the right. And you see two little green balls on top of the three yellow balls. Now, remember, if you've got the... Uh, E-text drawn up. You're still looking at that little box to the right. You're on about probably page 357. So those three yellow balls that we looked at, that's troponin. When two calciums combine with troponin, troponin pulls the tropomyosin off 
of the active sites. So troponin moves tropomyosin off of the active sites. Now that myosin head can connect with the active site. Now flip over to page 357 in your textbook. I'm going to take to look at this in the in the e-text you've got some nice animations in there if you uh, want to look at that so what I'm looking at now on page 357 I don't think it's 358. It's because uh, they have a concept boost there. I'm going to get you over there for in a few minutes. And you should see up at the top on the left-hand side a little illustration of the myosin. Those are the thick red filaments and the thin filaments of the actin. It says relaxed sarcomere. Does anybody see that? Relaxed sarcomere. How about it, Brooke? Do you see it? Lace, do you see it? You see it, Heather? You see it, Brian? Brianna? Good. It's on page 357, right? Good. Thank you, Lace. So you look up at the top and you see relaxed sarcomere. Now come down to the next line of the next box, the next rectangle, and you see the little one, two, three, four. Those are actin molecules. And you see the heads and the tails of the myosin. You see how the head is linked up to number one actin filament. Come on down to the next one, and you see the myosin contracts. It's a contractile protein, and it pulls the actin filament in, to, in towards the M line. Thanks, Brooke. That's the beginning of the contraction. Now, Kenya, you were asking about that. Is this starting the contraction? It's... In some respects, you could say that's the start of the contraction, and it occurs so quickly, just like snapping your fingers or blinking your eyes. This is our this is happening very quickly. So that myosin head pulls the one the number one in on the right. You see on the left, there's another one pulling it in. Remember, these these are like this. So if these were acting then the myosin will pull them in like that. And of course, it would happen on the other side too. So you come back and you see that little head grabbing number two in the next block. It looks so cumbersome. But remember all those heads 
They look like a bunch of little balls on the end of the head or maybe buds of a flower or something like that. So you got to mess up not just one, but they pull the actin into or in toward, I should say, the M line. Look at the very bottom. Now the muscle is contracted. And that can happen so quickly and very smoothly. So for relaxation, the calcium is taken back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is relaxation. Calcium goes back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or you can say goes back into the terminal cisterna. Now go back to page 346. On page 346, look at the bottom diagram, figure 10-7. Now find your Z-line. And look at the little coiled spring. See that little spring? The one's called Titan. And we mentioned this last uh, time we had a lecture, which let's say today's Tuesday, so we had it last Thursday, didn't we? Well, today, oh, excuse me, Monday. So remember, on each of your um, wheels on your car, you've got some sort of a spring that allows the, the, um, the tire to come up when you hit a bump, and the spring pushes it back down. So those little springs during contraction were compressed, just like when you hit a bump. That spring compresses... So it doesn't throw your whole car over. It just lifts up a wheel. It's got a tire on it. And so when you get back to regular pavement, that spring pushes back down, and now your four wheels are all in the same uh, height, in the same position, so you have a nice smooth ride. So those springs push back on the Z-line, and now the muscle is at rest. That's relaxation. Any questions so far? So you want to know that sequence of events. Now I want you to look on page 358.
Okay, Akinia, can you uh, can you tell me which step you missed, or which step you think you missed? Where do you think a step ought to fit in um, after the previous step that you've written down that, that you think you know? Some sort of terminal. Was it at the first when we had the acetylcholine released? Or was it the active site being opened on, ax on actin so that myosin could attach to it? Or was it when the action potential came down to T2? Okay, here we go. Okay, the sodium uh, rushed in from the cleft to the cytosol. That's true. And that sodium causes a change in the charge. Remember, the cell was basically negative on the inside and the outside was positive because you had more sodium ions. But when acetylcholine is released, it attaches to those protein channels they open, sodium rushes in, and you have a change in charge because positive on the inside of the muscle cell and it's negative on the outside. And so that action potential travels down the sarcolemma to the first tubule, the tubule, and goes down that tubule. Maybe that's the step that you're thinking about. Oh, no, you can't hear anything. Ashley's, Ashley Butts phone is frozen. Good old technology. Is that better or can you? Okay, good. Glad you got it. If you don't, if you have another question, you can just email me a note or something uh, after, or give me a, a phone call or whatever. We'll talk about it over the phone. Okay. So I want you to look on page three fifty eight. Page three fifty eight. I don't know that this is in your e text. And I would think it would be. You should have a box that says botulism and Botox. Does everybody see that? How about it? Uh, Brooke, you see it? Jordan, do you see it? The box and the title is botulism and Botox.
In addition to, it's on three. Is that 366? Second edition, yeah, 366. Wow, okay, well, 358 in this one. This is the, uh, well, they don't even list it on here. Yeah, I'm missing it on there too. <clears throat> Does anybody else see a box with that says botulism and Botox? Besides Heather. Brooke, Jordan, how about it? Page 358, upper left hand side um, corner. Okay, you see it, Jessica Session, uh, Shelly, and you see it, Jessica Sessions. Okay, you don't see it, Dominique. <sighs> well, perhaps you can just write this down. If you don't see anything, good. Where'd you find it, Paul? What page? What page did you find it on, Paul? Three, three sixty-five. Thanks, Paul. Okay, mine says three fifty-eight. Okay. Is there anyone who can't see it? Dominique, have you not found it yet? Good. I'm glad you're back, Ashley. Well, let's just skip it. Um, apparently, just can't, can't y'all can't find it, or some of you can't find it. Okay, well now let's look on uh, look on page three sixty one in your textbook. Look for a heading that says energy sources for skeletal muscle. Energy sources for skeletal muscle should have 10.5 by it on page 361. On page three, 361, you see this thing, this uh, heading says in the middle of the page says energy sources for skeletal muscle. I want you to look at the next heading and it says immediate sources of energy from muscle contraction. So that paragraph describes something I want you to know. Starts out with, says, when contraction begins, the main immediate source, energy source of the muscle fiber is stored as ATP. 
ATP is rapidly used or consumed, but is regenerated almost immediately by a reaction using a molecule called creatine phosphate. And you keep on reading down to where you see that little formula where it says ADP, which would be adenosine diphosphate plus creatine phosphate. You have CK over the little arrows. That's an enzyme. Produces ATP plus creatine. So that's where we get energy pretty fast. Now we can use it up pretty fast too. But that's where we get it very quickly if we don't push our muscles too hard. Okay. Let's go to page 363. And you look down at the bottom, you see a heading that says 10.6, muscle, uh, muscle tension at the fiber level. We're going to skip all that. And we're going to go over to, I'm on 368.10.7. Three sixty eight, section ten seven. You see muscle tension at the organ level. Anybody see that? The heading muscle tension at the organ level. Does anybody see that heading? Dominique, you found it? Okay, Brianna, okay, good. Now I want you to come down into that section where it says muscle tension at the organ level. Come down to motor units. Good, Jessica Sessions, that's good. Motor units. I want you to come down to the second line, and you see it says a single motor unit, a motor neuron. Second line over to the right, a single motor neuron along with its muscle fibers. It innervates. is called a motor unit. That's the definition of motor unit. Now come down to the next paragraph. At the bottom it says an average motor unit. An average motor unit consists of about 150 muscle fibers. That's the average. But this number can vary widely with the degree of motor control needed for the muscle. So the average is 150 muscle fibers per neuron, per motor neuron. Let's go on and keep reading. After it says control needed for the muscle, it says muscles that require fine control, such as those around the larynx, your voice box, or in the fingers, Got a lot of control. You can do a lot of things maneuvering these fingers. Or in the fingers, we'll have multiple small motor units, often containing as few as 10 muscle fibers per motor unit.
And the reason we do that is so that we have a lot of dexterity with these fingers. When you write, you guys don't, you don't write like this with moving your whole hand. You wiggle your pen or your pencil. And so you've got to have all kinds of very defined control in order to make the marks that we make. Those are not gross marks when you write on a test. So one motor unit in your finger might only have five or ten muscle fibers. You might have a lot of motor units with small numbers of muscles so that you have very precise control with these fingers. You think of a dentist, you think of a surgeon, you think of an artist and so forth. So when you have just a few muscle fibers with the motor unit, in other words, that neuron only innervates, say, 10 muscle fibers. That tells you that you can do very fine activity with those muscles. Think of your lips and your tongue. We make all kinds of shapes in making words, moving our tongue sometimes against the roof, sometimes against our lower teeth or whatever, and our lips can change all kinds of ways so we have a lot of control there. It's not gross movement, large movement. It's fine movement, F-I-N-E, very fine movement, very accurate movement. That's as opposed to, uh, say, your biceps. Picks up big loads. You don't need that fine movement. You just need gross movement to move a certain amount of weight. So in this paragraph, look at the last sentence of that paragraph dealing with the motor unit. And you see it says, Powerful muscles such as the postural muscles of the back and the gastrocnemius and the calf. And think about your thighs. Got some muscle on the back of the thigh and the front can have two to three thousand muscle fibers in each motor unit. Because we don't do fine work with our muscles in our thighs. It's gross movement. Now look at the picture, figure 25. Look at that uh, illustration. You see the spinal cord, and you see it uh, looks like a little butterfly in there, and then you've got your uh, red dot and your blue dot and the red line, the blue line, and so forth. That's a motor unit coming out, that one axon of a motor neuron. Follow that blue line and watch what it does. It divides into one, two, three, four, five neurons, and those neurons connect to the myofibrils, excuse me, to the uh, muscle fibers. And then you see over on the red one, You've only got three innervated there. Three fibers are innervated. So the fewer, the fewer muscle fibers you have on a neuron, the more precise control you've got. That makes sense? The more precise control you have, 
like with your lips and your tongue. Or they mentioned your vocal cords, your larynx, and making sounds. But our big muscles, like in our thighs and our calves, they have one motor neuron that will innervate, like it said, as many as two to 3,000. That's gross movement. Now, if you have no questions about that, look at the next uh, heading. Don't look at recruitment. Come to the next one and look at muscle tone. You see the term muscle tone? This small, amount of ten, this small amount of tension produces what is known as muscle tone. Look at the sentence above that. Even when a muscle is at rest, it still has some degree of tension. We all have that. If we're not using a muscle, it's still just a little contracted. Just slightly contracted. That's what they call muscle tone. Doesn't produce any kind of movement. It's possible for a person in the next paragraph, look at the sentence, first sentence. If the tone in the skeletal muscle is low, abnormally low, generally because of nervous system disorder or damage, then you can have hypotonia, lack of tone or low tone in a muscle. In other words, it's almost flaccid, F-L-A-C-C-I-D. It's almost flaccid. The opposite of that, you come down to the next bold print term, and you see hypertonia. Instead of hypotonia, all right, hypertonia. There's more tone than there should be. And you can see it says the muscle can be very firm. Let's go to the section called 10-8, Skeletal Muscle Performance. It says skeletal muscle performance. Have you found that, Jordan? 10.8, 10.8, skeletal muscle performance. Page 371. Jordan, you found it yet? Paul, anybody found it yet? Whoop. Brianna?
Okay, good, Brianna. Thank you, Dominique. Okay. Now, you know that people exercise and some of them like to lift heavy weights. And so as a consequence, the muscle can get larger and stronger, right? Look down at the bottom of page 371. or It's under the heading called resistance training. Should be on that page or within a page of that uh, where we were talking about skeletal muscle performance. You see the word hypertrophy. Thank you, bro. Hypertrophy. Hyper, above. Trophy is, go, is growth. So muscles hypertrophy as somebody exercises them, like these uh, weight builders, uh, weight lifters. Or you think of uh, the athletes that need strength and muscle, uh, the football players and basketball players and so forth. So look on page 372, figure 1027. Figure 1027. Look at the a muscle fiber at the upper left. And you see it's a cut, cut view. Everybody sees that? Good. It's a cut view. How many myofibrils do you have in that muscle cell? That's one cell, but how many myofibrils do you have? Anybody counted them up yet? How about it, Dominique? How many myofibrils do you see in there? Good, Jordan. Glad you got it. Okay, Kenya, you count eight of them, don't you? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's the little round structures you see inside that cell. You don't have to, uh, 12 of them yet. Now, you may be looking at a different one. Let me count down here for just a second. I think you're looking at that middle one, uh, Brianna, where the little arrow points to resistant, resi resistance training. You see that, Paul? You count in there and you see 12 as opposed to eight for the one over to the left. The one that's labeled muscle, blood vessel, uh, myofibrio, mitochondria. That's right, Dominique, you see eight. Now, follow the era on resistant training, resistance training, go down there, and you do see 12 myofibrils. And if you notice, the diameter of that muscle fiber that's going through resistance training, it's larger, isn't it? It has a greater diameter. But you also see there's an increased number of myofibrils. So the muscle is capable, when you exercise it, and increase the weights, and your biceps gets bigger, um, your pecs, as they call them, and so forth, get larger, your, your lats, 
your latissimus dorsi muscle, um, they get larger. And this is what happens. You produce more myofibrils, and therefore you get stronger. You can pick up greater, um, uh, heavier uh, objects than you could before. So that's what is called hypertrophy. We would say that muscle has hypertrophied, P-H-I-E-D. Now look what happens to the bottom one. You see it's called disuse. So the more you don't use the muscle, the more it shrinks and you lose some of the my myofibrils and therefore you lose some strength. Any question about uh, how a muscle enlarges and gets stronger? Okay. Thanks, Jessica. Appreciate that. We're on the last page of this particular chapter. Look on page 374 and look for a heading where it says smooth muscle. It should say visceral. What do we know about visceral muscle, Heather? Good, Jordan, you see it? What does visceral muscle mean to you? Okay, that's good. It's, it, it is involuntary. You don't have control over it. Kenya says it's in organs, and that's, that's true. Visceral uh, actually means organ. So we're talking about the muscle that's found in our organs. That's right, Heather. And it is involuntary. We don't have to worry about it doing its job. Where's the first place that visceral muscle takes place that we don't have any control over? Where's the first place? What part of our GI tract is where we start with visceral muscle? What organ? How about it, Dominique? Rihanna, where do you find it? It's in your esophagus. Oh, yeah, that's right, Heather. You start that swallowing. Push that hamburger and that bread and that pickle and that tomato down. And then your esophagus takes over and pushes it down. You don't have to control it. It's going to get it down to the stomach. And that is the way visceral muscle works. Good, Paul. That's good. Look at the picture on page 374 or underneath that visceral muscle, or they call it smooth muscle. Look at the picture down below. Look at the picture to the left. 
You see it says small intestine. And you notice there are two layers of muscle. This is visceral muscle. We don't have control over it. You've got some muscle, smooth uh, visceral muscle that runs lengthwise. And you've got some muscle that runs circumferential around the organ. So you got two layers. Some will run like this. Others will run like this. So you got your circular layer and you got your longitudinal layer. And you can see what a uh, visceral muscle cell looks like down at the bottom. I don't know what you want to describe that as. But it's certainly not striated, is it? Now, but right underneath that heading... Where it says smooth muscle, I'm calling it visceral muscle. Come on down to where you see peristalsis. You see, and read that little section there in the peristalsis. You want to know what peristalsis is. And then you want to read the formation of sphincters. Rings of smooth muscle. We've got rings of smooth muscle in our body. This is a sphincter. You got one at the other end of your GI tract. What's the other end of the open the other opening of the GI tract? Nobody knows yet, huh? Well, you got one right here. Think about the other end. You got a sphincter below your bladder. Got a sphincter at the end of your esophagus, right above your stomach. Got a sphincter at the end of your stomach and the beginning of the small intestine. All those sphinx sphincters uh, play a role in controlling how much goes through your uh our body, and in the case of that, the GI tract. That takes care of that chapter. I bet all of you are going, yay! It's got a lot in it, doesn't it? I understand that. I've been there and done that. And you are there at this point in history and you can do that too do you have any questions any of you want to email me a, a question and I'll, I'll be around here and you can uh, I'll try and send it um, Brianna you're right there's a rectum down there I was thinking of the sphincter particularly called the anus that's the circular muscle that we have control over. And the rectum, we really don't have control over. It's got some muscle in it, but it stretches. And when it stretches, that tells us we need to go find the bathroom. And then we open our anus up, and out comes the waste material. Anus is right at the bottom of the uh, rectum. Any other questions?
Okay, don't forget to study five and six. We're getting close. I think they're going to be able to get a uh, honor lock on there now. So um, we'll see how that goes. Getting kind of frustrating on this end. I'm sure on your end too. Good. That's good, Brianna. Any more questions? Okay, email them if you have a question. I'm going to exit out of this unless you have a question. Okay. You're going to get out early. Four minutes. All right. See you come Monday. Have a nice weekend. And keep your distance. You don't want to get this stuff. Although it doesn't seem to bother you guys as much as it might take me out since I'm considered elderly. All right. Bye-bye.